Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to welcome you to Word of Life Fellowship this morning. And we're going to begin in our service. And I would just ask that you, if you could, just please stand to your feet. For the throne of grace and prayer with us this morning. Amen. 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 All hearts and minds clear. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for this morning, Father God, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that you've given us, Father God, to, to get closer to you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, to develop a more intimate relationship with you, Father God. Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to be here in this place of worship, Father God, in the name of Jesus, with our, our whole entire hearts, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, and we couldn't express to you more oftenly or, or better how much we love you and how much we're thankful for you. Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy that you can continue to, to shine upon us each and every day, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, and we ask that you continue to do that, Father God, as we go to this service. Lord, and we go through this day, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, and we just thank you for that, Father God. Lord, we ask that you just bless the praise team this morning, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Touch each and every one of them, Father God, in the name of Jesus. They go before the throne of grace and to praise you, Father God, and to worship you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. With their whole hearts, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. And we just thank you for that. Father God, we ask you to bless each and every instrument, Father God. And those who are playing the instruments, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to anoint the voices of the singers this morning, Father God. And we just thank you for them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, empty up their hearts, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And fill them with your spirit right now, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for them, Lord. We thank you for the service that's going to go forth today, Father God. We ask that you bless the man of the man of God that's going to bring the word today, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we ask you to build his strength up this morning, Father God. Fill his breath with fill his, his lungs with your, your breath, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, give him strength beyond strength, Father God, in the name of Jesus. To deliver the word, Father God, that your people need to hear this morning, Father God. And we just thank you for that. Lord, we ask you just to anoint the doorways in, in, every, in every place in this church, Father God. The pews, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Bless each and every person that's here this morning, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, touch their hearts, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, let the Spirit be among them, Father God, in the name of Jesus. To give them what they came here for this morning, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for that, Father God. Lord, we just ask you to continue to bless the birth family, Father God, and be with them, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Bless them mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially, Father God. Go before them in any setting, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for them. Lord, we thank you for the servants here this morning, Father God, in the name of Jesus. Continue to bless them, Father God. Anoint each of them, each and every one of them, Father God, with a continued service, servant's heart, Father God. And let that be infectious, Father God, among the congregations, Father God, to not only serve themselves, but to continue to serve other people's Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And we just thank you, Father God. We thank you for this community, Father God. We ask you to bless this community, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I'll turn you over to, uh, before that, I, we're going to go before and give the scripture reading. Amen. 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 The word of the Lord reads as such in John 10 and 11, and it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his own life for the sheep. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing upon the reading his word. Now I turn it over to the praise team. Amen.
before you know it, the people left out of here empowered. Um, somebody say, better days are coming. Our children will be released. Kayla's throwing up the big C. I mean, that's what that means. Um, parents, you better get her out your lap because you're going to have it for three months. <laughs> they out of school, so y'all going to. I do this every year. I say this every year this time. I ask that you all pray for my wife. Um, oh, he's so cute. I ask that you all pray for my wife. Yes, uh, Because Kayla's out of school and I'm off work for three months and she got to deal with both of us. Next three months. Wake up every day. How you doing? Yeah, no, Kayla don't want to All right, all the kids out? We're going to have to talk about to our visitors, God bless you. So good to see uh, visitors here today. Uh, Bishop Taylor, you're not a visitor, but every time you're here, I want to honor you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lady Fayetta, God bless you. And, and Pastor and Vibrator, it was June 13th, the new members. June 13th? Yeah. Okay, so June 13th, right after service, what we do is um, we have the hall set up for all the people who have recently, when I say recently, I mean, because we haven't done this since COVID started. So um, if you're in the house and you're new to the ministry, we want to meet with you all right after service on June 13th. We'll provide lunch and uh, we'll just have a little conversation with you to let you know who we are and where we're going. Okay. I, believe, I believe that's important for you to know when you link up with the ministry. Who is the ministry and where are they going? All right. So um, we will, it takes about an hour, and we just kind of discuss vision, and we kind of get to know you and want you to get to know us. Um, life is pretty hectic at times, so we don't really get a chance to know each other. And it's my desire. And, and this is just me. I'm kind of old school, in a sense, where once a month I ask for the complete membership roster, and they give it to me once a month. And I ask for it once a month because, oh, he want to do something. Bless his heart. Bless his soda. Oh. He wants soda? <laughs> yeah, he can preach if he wants to. Um, I'm old school in a sense to where I get this list from Evangelist Sandy every month. And I spend time in prayer, praying for each and every individual on that list. And so I need to, I like to know a face to who whose name I'm calling out, all right? And so that's why we do these settings where we say, look, I want to meet you. I want you all to get to know me. And I want you to know who we are, my wife and I, the leadership, and I want you to know where the church is headed, all right? So next Sunday, if you're not too busy on the 13th, stick around afterwards. We'll have some nice, uh, who made that punch last night? Barbara. Oh, the barber. Where's, where is she? When, when I was when I was 13, that punch was it. Now that I'm for my 40s, I said, ooh, I need a <laughs> Yeah, so we'll have some we'll have some punch for you. I'll tell you that much. No, stay out there. We'll have some food and something for you. All right. Yeah, he said he liked it, I think. Yeah, boy. That's all right. I love the other barber, but I said, who made the cough syrup? That stuff was strong last night. I'm sorry. She know I love her. Okay. Listen, I, wanted, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes. <laughs> it was the house party cooler. That's what it was. Remember, peanut was pouring all this shit. That was what it was. <laughs> all right, now listen to our visitors. I told them last week, if you don't want to laugh in church, go to another church, okay? Please. And this, we serve the Lord with gladness, right? We like to have a good time serving the Lord. So if you're too deep to laugh on a Sunday morning, you may not want to be here, okay? We good? All right. That, that was your consent to laugh. That's it right there, okay? So you can't sue me for laughing later. Okay, listen. Um, I want to talk to you a few minutes about the fact that uh, you're a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. You're a masterpiece, but you're a work in progress at the same time. And I know that's kind of oxymoronic. That doesn't make sense because a masterpiece is normally a finished product, right? Work in process means that the product isn't finished. And none of us are finished products. And, and I want us to be encouraged because none of us are quite where we want to be. Has, any, has anybody in the room just finally got to the place where they completely want to be, right? 
So we're none of us are completely where we want to be, right, but, right. but I'm sure we all have the same testimony. We're so glad we're not who we used to be. Right? Anybody have that testimony where I look back over my life and I think about all the stupid stuff I used to do and all the attitudes I used to carry and all the insecurities I once had and I didn't like what I saw in the mirror, I didn't like what I had in the bank account, I didn't like I didn't like anything about me, and I'm so glad that although I'm not where he destined me to be yet, I'm not who I used to be. So in his eyes, I'm a masterpiece, but I'm also a work in progress at the same time. I want us to embrace who we are and where we are right now in this moment. Because if you're in Christ, he has you right where he wants you to be. And you, like I said, you may not know every scripture of the Bible, but embrace where you are right now. You may not know all the old hills, but embrace where you are right now. And I'll be honest with you, you might not be delivered from cussing. Embrace where you are right now, because if you're in Christ, he has you. Now, there you go. I got three people who can testify to the fact that I'm not all the way delivered from cussing, but I'm not going to let you condemn me because I'm in Christ. And because I'm in Christ, I'm right where he wants me to be. Anybody know that you're a work in progress in Christ right now? Paul said in Philippians 3, the scripture that says I can do all things through Christ. Before that, he says, it's not that I have already attained perfection. He says, but I'm pressing forward toward the mark. What he said was, look, I'm not perfect, but I'm pressing. Some of us realize that we're not perfect, but we allow our imperfections to stop our press. Because we've allowed people to tell us that we weren't worthy of God's grace. We've allowed people to tell us that we weren't worthy to serve in church. We weren't worthy to preach the gospel. We weren't worthy. And some of us right now come to church every Sunday really wanting to serve, really because you have a gift and you want to push forward, but you got people in your ear telling you you're not worthy because I know what you did last night and I know what you did last week and I know who you used to be. Well, I need you to understand that we're all works in progress. So you have every right to stand up in righteous indignation and say, you might have known what I did last night, but how do you know? So either one of two things, you were either there with me or you were on my social media stalking me. Either way, you need delivery for stuff. All the stalkers got quiet in the room real quick. Some of y'all only on Facebook to be nosy. You won't post nothing, you won't share nothing, but you're going to browse everybody's stuff. So you can tell Bishop, guess what I saw? No, don't you tell me what you saw. I need us to understand that God sees us as masterpieces in spite of the way other people see us and in spite of the fact that we see ourselves as broken things. Speaking of broken things, I remember a time where Kayla, y'all remember when kids used to just like getting crayons for Christmas? Yeah. Yes. Y'all know? So am I that old? Y'all remember you got the 64 with the sharpener on the box? You could show it out. You had the sharpener on the right, 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 right. And Kayla used to know that she still likes to draw, but she, she, she used to color a lot. And now, now she colors with her Uncle Marvin, but they use a tablet. They use a pad or something yeah. like that, right? But they don't use crayons anymore. Okay, but they used to the time where there would be crayons. And I, and I want to speak to the broken people. Because one time Kayla was upset because her favorite crayons were broken. Right, right. And you don't know what it's like if you don't know what it's like to comfort a three-year-old because her crayons are broken. You ain't lived yet. And I'm, we're sitting there, we're trying to tell her, baby girl, it's okay, it's okay, they're just crayons, we can get you more, but why don't you draw today? And Kayla sat down and she took that broken crayon and she started drawing. And the funny thing about it is, it was one of the prettiest pictures she ever did. And at that moment, God helped me realize that even broken pieces can create masterpieces. And so you may feel like they're broken right now, but God is saying, if you just submit your broken pieces to me, I can still be mad. See, here's the thing. We think God wants perfection. If God wanted perfection, he wouldn't have had to send Jesus to the cross. But how do you know, how do you know that he was wounded for my transgressions? He was bruised. Do you know what that means? That means my imperfection on the cross. So look, God, there, there's this term. There's this term called exnihilo. E-X-N-I-H-I-L-O. It's a Hebrew term. And that, that term literally means um, finished. Uh, finished product. Right. God speaks in NX Nigo. He speaks in finished product. So when God calls you as a prophet, now I'm just, I'm not picking nobody, okay? God calls you as a prophet. 
He knows you're a prostitute, but he calls you prophet. Y'all hear what I'm saying? When God calls you a psalmist, he knows you're a crackhead, but he calls you psalmist. Right? Can I, can I, can I come down the road a little bit? Can I, can I just go down the road now? When God calls you something, he knows where you are, but he's not calling you to perfection. He's calling to his voice. And so this is why God was able to call Abraham the father of many nations, even though Sarah hadn't had a baby yet. Y'all with me? Okay, all right. Y'all with me so far? And so some of us sitting here right now refusing to accept the call of God in our life because his call don't look like our circumstance. Right, right. Come on. His voice does not sound like what we're struggling with right now. Uh -huh. And so some of us right now are missing out on the grand scheme of things because we refuse to look beyond the fact that we see what we see and acknowledge the fact that God sees not only what we're in but where we should be. Uh -huh. We keep saying, Jesus, take the will. Uh -huh. But I think sometimes, I said last week, we want to hold on to part of it. I'll tell you another story about Kayla real quick. Let me get you into this process. Kayla and I started this thing when she was two, mm -hmm. where she would drive the truck. Mm -hmm. She couldn't reach the pedals. She said, I'm alive. She just drive the truck. Kayla's big now. Yep. Yeah, she's about six foot 12, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and now she gets to you laugh. You can't sue me. You can't, all right. So, now she gets in the car, she says, Daddy, can I drive from the mailbox? Yeah, baby, come on. And Kayla gets on my lap. We look like Shaq and Kobe in a VW. Just... <laughs> and so one day Kayla said, Daddy, I don't need you to touch the wheel, and you can sit over there. I think I can do this. Obviously, I got scared, and I said, no, because I don't know if you can handle that. You're not going to kill me today. But two, I thought about something. God said, isn't that just like some of the believers? Come on now. Right? Yeah. Come on, bitch. You want my presence, but you don't want my power. Yeah. Ah. You want me in the car with you, but you won't let me steer the wheel. Wow. Right? Right? And so when we say we trust God through every circumstance and we trust God through everything, it seems like we can trust God for our life bill to be paid, we can trust God for our children to be saved, but we don't want to trust God for our purpose to be fulfilled. Because he called me preacher, but I'm out there doing something else. God said, I know what you're doing, and yet I, as a matter of fact, I knew that you would be doing what you're doing when I called you. Right. Amen. Y'all, quiet on me. There's this thing. that takes us from mm -hmm. work in progress to masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And I preached a variation of this message before, I think on Estrella. Mm -hmm. But, and I, I believe I did, and we, had a, we actually had a table out. Mm -hmm. And, and this, 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 this thing is called a potter's wheel. Right, right, right. And if you ever watch a potter, anybody seen Ghost and all those movies? Right, right, right. I, I'm gonna put this down. If you've ever watched a potter behind a potter's wheel, what he's doing is he takes a piece of clay. Yes, right. And the clay is nothing. It's just a piece of clay. Yes, right? yes, Genesis 1 and 2 says that God made us from clay. Yes, we were nothing, right? We're nothing. Somebody say, I'm nothing without God. <laughs> no, say it like you really mean, I'm nothing without God. <laughs> so he took this, well, one more time for the Holy Ghost. I'm nothing without God. <laughs> I hear the Holy Ghost, what about me? Okay, there, we got you. All right. So God took this clay and made this living being, yes. right? And he made this living being and he blew, blew the breath, breath of life into it and he became man, right? And so the potter takes this clay and he puts it on top of the table. Now the potter's wheel is something like a table sitting here, there's a chair, and there's like a gas pedal, right? Like an accelerator in the car, okay? The, get, the clay gets thrown on the table and then the potter now puts his foot on the gas pedal and the, the wheel starts to spin, right. okay? And as the, wind, as the wheel spins, the potter is now forming the clay. Yeah. Every once in a while, if you've ever gone to some of these places, uh, uh, like the alley and, and, and uh, what's, what's y'all store? Uh, the, 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 yes, that thing right there, Hobby Lobby, right. Um, if you ever go to these stores, you see these pieces of pottery. You'll see some that are perfect. Oh, oh, that's so beautiful. But then have you ever looked at one that was really beautiful until you turned it around? And you saw one of the lies kind of got skewed a little bit. Y'all been there? Y'all yeah, seen that? Right, right, right. Y'all need to get out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I ain't never been there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so what happens is we overlook that piece of pottery because of a small imperfection. Y'all with me so far?
far? Okay. Fast forward and put it in your seat. You look at yourself and you see yourself. You see the fact that you believe that you're beautiful. You see the fact that you got your hair did, you whipping it back and forth, all that kind of stuff. Right? Right? right. Brothers, you went to the gym, you working down the stomach with me and everybody else, and you starting to get your hub on a little bit. Right? You got your car clean and it's polished and everything's looking good. You rolling, got the seat all the way back, playing what you want to play. And then all of a sudden, you remember a vulnerability in your life. Uh, and suddenly you start to think that you're no longer right, right. worth anything. Yeah. But even beyond you, have you ever seen it where people come into church and they're anointed and they're gifted and you're excited about them coming here until you hear something about them? Y'all hear what I'm saying? I'm going to call his name because it's my brother, but my, my, my brother, Pastor DJ, was here last night, and he got up to do worship, and he did worship. I mean, he, he did worship. And I'm watching as he was escorted to the front seat, and I'm just watching, so I'm standing right here. And he walks in, got on his skinny pants, that's how he dresses now. Don't say that about my brother with we'll, we'll tables. Okay, he got a skinny pants, got a skinny jacket, got holes in his knees and his pants and all that kind of stuff. And he comes up here and he's leading worship. And I saw some people couldn't look beyond what they thought was an imperfection. <laughs> worship was already here. And he took us to another level. My assignment, I have the text. I said, listen, I want you to close us out, and I want you to close us out in a crazy praise. He took us from point B all the way to point C in a praise. And for those of us that could get beyond the holes and rips in his jeans, we had a time. Yeah. <laughs> but somebody and some people looked at the pot and saw the beauty of the singing the beauty of the anointing, and were turned off because when they turned the pot around, they saw a small imperfection. God is saying, you have imperfections that not, 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 not many people can count, but you're still a masterpiece. God is saying, don't you allow people to disqualify you because of your imperfections, because no one disqualified them because of their imperfections. Uh, everybody has an opinion until their imperfections get exposed. Uh, come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Y'all remember John chapter 9? The woman that was caught in adultery? They brought her to Jesus. And they said, hey, Jesus! Woo! We caught her. Red handed. And the funny thing is, these jokers knew the word. Because they said, the word says that if she's caught in adultery, she should be punished. The Bible says Jesus got out on his knees and he started writing in the dirt. A wise preacher told me that's why it's so good to let Jesus get in your dirt. Yeah. Jesus got up and many people, many theologians try to figure out what he wrote. Nobody knows what he wrote or said. But whatever he wrote, he got their attention. And Jesus got up and he stood and he said, let me without sin cast the first stone. And they all took off running. Jesus turned and looked at the woman and said, now, where'd your accusers go? That was a rhetorical question, because he knew they were going to leave. But this is the funny part. They were loud when they caught her and heard us. But as soon as it was an opportunity for their mess to be exposed, they got real quiet. Y'all yeah. yeah. catch that? Y'all seen it in church before, where some of the most judgmental, hypocritical people are noisy, and then when they get quiet, sometimes you think, oh, maybe they got delivered. Or maybe somebody found out something about them. Yeah. Imperfections. We got to understand that we all have them. But that does not disqualify us from the grace of God or the call of God in our lives. Yeah. God ain't going to bless no cussing preacher. Help me, Peter. I'm here. Y'all not to me? God ain't going to bless no man who can't control himself. Help me, David. I'm right here. God won't move through a prostitute. Rahab said, well, here I am. Hello. And if you get it twisted, God said, keep playing with my vessels, and I'll use a donkey like I did in Numbers. Okay, so let me help you with this podcast. All right, then we're done. Am I helping anybody? Yeah. yeah. Anybody mad? No. no. You sure? Yeah. All right, cool. All right. I mean, I didn't care, but I was going to make sure. Okay, all right. <laughs> keep 
going on it. And the preacher said that, okay, take up the word. Because everything I tell you is in the scripture. All right? So if I say anything that upsets you, take it up with the author, not me. Okay? You with me? All right. So the question is concerning the potter's will. If you look in Jeremiah, he's building this, this wheel, this potter, this piece of pottery. And he notices that it's messed up, it's marred, it's, 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 it's kind of uh, uh, unrepairable. And so he smashes it. He smashes it. He smashes it. Some people say that's messed up. He spent a lot of time building it, now he's going to mash it down. But don't look at the pottery, look at us. How sometimes God has seen things going on in our lives while we're on this wheel, and he's mashed us, and he's crushed us. Have you ever felt crushed by God before? Yeah. Where we're no, I'm serious, where one minute you live in this high, the next minute you live in this low, yeah. right? You you ain't yeah, 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 y'all been there, okay, y'all been there, right? But then one minute everybody loves you, next minute everybody hates Chris, all that kind of stuff, right? Right? And God is saying, I allow all this to happen. I have to crush you for a reason. Because although you were pretty, although you were growing, you have some imperfections that will mess with your foundation. This is why you can't get mad when God removes people and adds people, when God removes money and adds money. You can't get mad when God removes jobs and adds jobs. When God is saying this, I'm, re I'm reshaping you on his wheel. Are you willing to be crushed? Are you willing to be crushed? Some of us are fighting crushing right now. God is trying to crush our egos. He's trying to crush our entitlement. He's trying to crush our religious spirits. And we're refusing to be crushed. And God is saying in this season, when people are coming back to the church after the pandemic, they're not trying to go anywhere where people ain't willing to be crushed. So here's this crushing process. There's four steps. Four steps. Four steps. I'm not like old Baptist preachers getting ready to close six times. Close just four steps. <laughs> Y'all remember, I'm getting ready to close. Ten minutes later, I'm showing for the clothes. Fifteen minutes later, hold your nuts, I'm about to close. That's not me. Okay. All right. I'm trying to, uh... All right, uh... I think we have, I think we have a dating connections. Not uh, issues. All right. The devil is alive. Amen. No, it's all right. It's all right. It's okay. This is what we want to do. Uh, well, Satan may keep playing. When the word is in you, you okay. <laughs> this potter's will, after he crushes you, after he crushes the clay, uh -huh. he starts to knead it. Knead it. K-N-E-E-D. He starts to knead it. With his knuckles, he's kneading it. A lot of risk. A lot of, a lot of effort in that. He's kneading out all the lumps. Isn't it funny how you didn't know that there was lumps in the pot until it was crushed? What is a lump? A lump is something that's blocking something, right? Whenever, whenever, where you went, when you go get, when you go get your, 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 your mammograms, if they discover lumps, they go and remove the lumps immediately because the lumps present a danger to you, do they not? If you have a lump in your throat, a lump in your thyroid, that's a danger, right? The lump has to be removed because the lump is showing that A, something is being blocked, and B, there's a sign of infection. And so when he broke the pot down from in the clay, he put it down the clay, before he started to rebuild it, he worked the lumps out. This is where God is saying some of us are right now. We are broken, but we can't be reestablished until he works out the lumps. If not, you'll be a lumpy preacher. You'll be a lumpy praise leader. Remember I told you, lumps are a sign of infection in the body, right? So now he's kneading out the lumps. He's kneading out the lumps, and now he's getting ready to put the pot, the clay back on the pot. Because now that the lumps are kneaded out, now the clay is malleable. Somebody say malleable. Malleable, malleable means it's ready to be formed any way that he wants it. Right? When God crushes you, he's crushing you for the sole purpose of reforming you the way that he designed you to be formed. Right? Amen. Now this is the part where you have to lay down your will and be subject to his will. Yes. Because this may mean that he may shift your assignment in the midst of you getting rebuilt. Mm -hmm. right. uh -huh. wow. Have you ever been asked by leadership or anybody else to do something that you thought was outside of what you normally do? Never forget it. About nine years ago, 
at our convocation eight years ago, uh, I, I put together the curriculum for all the breakout classes. And we had tiers. We had children, we had teens, we had adults, and we had senior leadership. Now, at the time, I'm the overseer of this region. So we're getting the convocation. I'm just waiting to get my assignment because I know I got to do something heavy. And I get there and find out I'm teaching children's church. <laughs> Y'all, I was hot. <laughs> Not that I don't love children, but at the moment, I thought that was beneath me. Uh, Are y'all right. uh, And so I had an attitude. But I wouldn't go rebe uh, rebel against leadership. I just said, how am I going to do it? So the first day I walked in there with the kids, mad. Y'all sit down, y'all mad, y'all going to do this. this Jesus said, bye. <laughs> that was me the first day. Went back to the hotel room. And the Lord took me to Matthew 18. Where he said, unless you come to me as a child, you will not inherit the kingdom. Yeah. He said, how dare you minimize that which I call the most precious. Oh. The next day I went, we had color books, Greek and Hebrew. We did it all. Right? But I say that because when God crushes you, before he rebuilds you, he's going to work out all the loves and make you malleable so he can form you the way that he wants to form you. Anybody tired of doing this on your own and bumping your head every week after week, month after month? Anybody tired of saying, I got this, and then you find out that you don't got it, and you end up in a worse situation than what? Anybody tired of being the children of Israel? Take something that should have took a few days, took you 40 years, because why? You just wouldn't wait on God. God has said, this time, let me form you so you won't wake up with the wrong man. Come on. This time, let me form you so you won't marry the wrong woman. This time, let me form you so you won't leave your good job for some crazy. So let me form you this time. So the first step is get the loves out. Your second step is Mally. He makes you Mally. Right, right. Third step is key. The potter now has his clay. And it's now ready to be formed. And he blows it to he blows into the clay. I would think that he would blow into the clay after it was already on the wheel. But he blows into it while it's still in his hand being formed. God will take the foolish things of the world. That's what the scripture says. And so he has his clay in his hands and he blows into it. Genesis 2 and 7, he had the clay in his hands and he blew into it. Then he made it. Blow. Ruach. It's the breath of God. It's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, verse two it says, in verse 1 in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, right? Verse 2, it says, and the Spirit moved upon the waters. The word spirit there is Ruach. That's the breath of the Holy Spirit. Nothing can be formed without the breath of the Holy Ghost. Y'all remember the Valley of the Dry Bones? Every time you use this example, Deacon Bobby, you have to watch. Okay, watch. Uh, Mark, I'm going to need you to follow me real quick. I'm going to put this up. Right. So the Valley of Dry Bones is this, right? The prophet went out to the Valley of Dry Bones. He's on the board, so I asked him to follow me. Because, right. So went to the Valley of Dry Bones, right? And he saw all these bones laying there. And he said, son of man, can these bones live again? He said, sure they can live again. Tell them to stand up. And so the Bible says that the bones stood up. And the knee bone connected to the thigh bone. And the thigh bone connected to the hip bone. Then the hip bone connected to the backbone. And the backbone connected to the neck bone. And the neck bone connected to the head bone. And before you know it, the foot bone connected to the ankle bone. And the ankle bone connected to the shin bone. And then the arm bone connected to the shoulder bone. And the hand bone connected to the arm bone. And the arm bone connected to the torso bone. And now they stood. They stood. Multitude of bodies standing there. But they couldn't live. They had no life in them. The Spirit of the Lord said, Now, Son of Man, breathe into those bones. The bones he breathed into them, the flesh started before and they became alive. What God is saying is this I'm going to rebuild you, but you can't move until I blow you. Acts chapter 1 and 8. Now, Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go into all the nations, right. preach the gospel. 
Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what it said. That's in the book, right? Right. So now they're getting ready to leave Jerusalem to go across the world to go preach the gospel. But Acts 1 and 8, he says, tarry in Jerusalem for a while. Don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Ghost. What Jesus is trying to tell them is, you can't go do your assignment until I'm born. you. And so what happens is, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. You have to go to church, and worship is going forth, and you don't feel nothing. That's because they dance without the breath. You have to go to church, and the preacher is preaching, but you ain't received nothing. Chances are they could be preaching without the breath. And so God has you down in his hand, and before he places you on the wheel, he blows on you. Somebody say, blow. This is it. This is the fourth part, then we're done. From that point, once he's blown on you, now he can form you. God is not going to empower perversion. He's not going to empower anything that's out of order. By perversion, he, you think perversion, you think something sexual. No, perversion is something that's out of order. God's not going to blow on something that's out of order. And so but the reason why he waited until after he got all the lust out of you is because he was not going to waste his breath. Now, God me. And so now he has you, and he has you on the wheel. He's blowing on you, and now he can start to form you. This is the part where we all are right now, I believe, for the most part. We're on this wheel. The wheel is spinning, and he's forming us into what he wants us to be. The crazy thing about the forming process is it's not always comfortable. Because there's sometimes while the clay is spinning that he has to actually put a denture into it to shape it to size. So here it is, you're spinning on the wheel. He's forming you, and you pull a punch in your side. That's not the devil. That's God forming you. We give too much credit to the enemy. The enemy had, doesn't have that kind of power. Yeah. You're spinning on the wheel, and before you know it, your top is blown off. That's not the enemy. That's God forming you in this process. And if you're in here today and you're discouraged because you know, I'm trying all I can to serve the Lord, but I keep getting hurt in the process, stop giving the devil glory yeah, and realize that God is using all these things yes, to build you into what he wants you to be. Yeah. Two stories about imperfections. When we're off this potter's wheel for this season of life, we're still going to have some imperfections. It will be a masterpiece when we're working in progress, right? Two examples. One, Mona Lisa is the most well-known painting in the world. The reason why you can tell a Mona Lisa are authentic from a fraud is because the authentic has a flaw. Now, I'm not going to tell you to do your homework, right? You'll find out what the flaw is. Van Gogh created a he created masterpieces. One of his most uh, amazing uh, pictures, one of the ones that sells the that sold for the highest bid, has a flaw in it that most artists can catch that the common eye can't catch. But even in that flaw, he said, "I'm not going to ruin a whole painting just to fix that one thing." God is saying, "I'm not going to destroy a thing." Y'all not hear me? Jesus Himself, after the resurrection. The Bible says he appeared to the disciples, kind of walked through the wall. And they were like, well, how do we know it's you? And Jesus said, look at my scars. See what it appears to them? Here it is, you're frustrated because you got scars. And God said, your scars are proof that you're alive. Amen. Hallelujah. Your scars are proof that you're still here. And so to the scarred person, to the wounded person, I'm not even talking about scarred physically, because we all got those. But I'm talking about scarred in your soul, scarred spiritually, wounded spiritually. God is saying it did not kill you. Therefore, it's a part of your process on the part of If you could just submit to God today, allow him to crush you, allow him to get all the imperfections out, allow him to put you on the wheel again, allow him to blow on you and form you to what he wants you to be this season, I promise you, you make the devil madder than he's ever been. And we're in the business of frustrating Satan. Y'all know that, right? Amen. Right? Because when Satan frustrates, he has to flee. That's what the word says. Resist the devil, and he will what? He will flee from you. So today, I encourage us all, stop looking at the imperfections of others. 
and stop dwelling on our own imperfections. Give that to God and serve him with all you have left. Father, I thank you just for reminding us that although we're imperfect, we're still a masterpiece according to you in Ephesians 2. God, I thank you because with our imperfect selves, you didn't stop creating until you created us. And Lord, when you created us, you did something for us that you didn't do for any other being. You gave us your spirit. You created us in your image. And so now, God, I speak to the person who's insecure, ashamed of who they think they are. Lord, I speak life into them right now. Father, allow them to see themselves in the mirror the next time the way that you see them. And God, I speak to the person who spends so much time looking at the faults of others that they fail to see they have imperfections as well. God, I pray the next time they look in the mirror that they see themselves the way that you see them. God, most importantly, I pray that we stay on that wheel. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen. Come on, let's celebrate for us. There's, there, there, there's, there's a story that the Lord told me to share right, before, right when I finished praying. That's why I paused. And some of you have heard it before, and that's fine. If you've heard it before, be quiet. Don't, don't spoil it for nobody. Okay? Okay. Deal? Deal. There was a woman, Sister Gray, sitting in church. And after church, the pastor went to the door to greet all the people. You know, thank you for coming. God bless you. Blah, 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 blah. Grace and peace. And the woman came, and he says, Sister Jones, did you enjoy service today? She said, I did. Ooh, you preached. But the woman in the row next to me kept showing God. And then the woman behind me kept playing on her phone. And then the musicians put their laughing and joking. And then the first lady was asleep. We'll talk about that when we get home. Okay. And so he says, Sister Jones, you know, I didn't even catch that. I was preaching, I didn't even catch it. He said, but I'll tell you what, next week come to church. And I got a special assignment for you. I want you to write down everything that you see. And then bring it to me after church. Because we're going to have a problem. She was excited. Because she's going to be on the hall monitor next week. She got to church early. I mean, stepped out. Bishop, I'm here. All right, this is what I want you to do. Here's your notepad. Here's, I gave you my good pen. Here's your good pen. Okay, is there anything else? Yes. Here's a full glass of water. Woo, I'm going to be writing a lot of tickets. It's going to be thirsty. No. I don't want you to drink it. It's full. Oh, it's full. He said, I want you to hold on to it. He said, and I don't want a drop of water to come out because I'm going to be thirsty after I preach. She said, oh, okay, Bishop, no problem. So church is going on. Praise happening. She's trying to shout and hold the glass. She wanted to fall out. The woman behind her, chewing gum. Woman in front of her on her cell phone. Musicians up there joking around. Church ends. She says, Bishop! I know you thirsty. Here's your water. Not a drop came out of it. He said, oh, thank you, Sister Joan. He took the water and started drinking. He said, by the way, did you notice the woman behind you on her phone? She said, oh, matter of fact, I didn't. He said, did you happen to notice the woman in front of you chewing her gum? You know what, Bishop? I sure didn't see that. Okay, but surely you saw the musicians up there cutting up. No, I didn't see that either. But she said, that's why, that's a praise God. She said, what do you mean? He said, because you were focusing your own assignment. You have no, you didn't have a minute to check out nobody else. I promise you, if you come to church focused on your assignment, you won't have any business at any time to check out anybody else. So whatever your assignment is for that particular week, do it with all that you have and let God deal with everybody else. Can we celebrate the Lord one more time? I don't have to move because he's over there. So I don't understand. You know what I mean? okay. Is there one in here that doesn't know Jesus on today? We want to make sure that everybody leaves here having the opportunity to get saved if they're not. What does that mean? Jesus said in Matthew 24 that you'll know the end is near by these signs. He said there'll be many false messiahs. There'll be many people that say, I'm the one. He said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. He said there'll be earthquakes in all kinds of places. He said when you see those things happening, that means I'm on my way back. 
Now, Paul tells the Thessalonians, why? First Thessalonians, he says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, meaning that the trumpet can sound and suddenly the signs open. Those who are in Christ that are dead will rise and those that are in Christ will go with them. But here's the question though. What if, what time is it? 11.58. It's 11.58. What if at noon the trumpet sounded and the sky opened? Do you know where you'll open your eyes next? If you're not sure that you'll be with Jesus, that means that you need to be saved. Because the alternative is hell, and hell is a hot place. There'll be weeping and gnashing of the teeth, is what Jesus said. Now, being saved does not mean that you're perfect. Being saved does not mean that you're not going to make mistakes. Being saved means that when you do make mistakes, you have an advocate who will cover you in prayer. Being saved means that you know where you're going to end up in eternity. And if you have a loved one who's passed on, who you know lived the life of the Lord, being saved means you'll see them again. So if there's one that needs to be saved today, raise your hand. We're not going to embarrass you. We just, want to, we just want to welcome you in. If there's one that needs to give their life back to the Lord, meaning I was saved and I kind of messed up a little bit, don't worry, we've all been there. There's one right there. Is there another one? Is there another one? There's two. There's two. There's three. There's three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's three. Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? There's another. I, is, is there another? I'm going to move. There's more. Lord, 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 I, I once was saved and I was on fire for you. But life happened and things got in the way and I started to take steps back. But now today I want to rededicate my life back to you. Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? Five, 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 five. Six, six. All right, seven, seven. Come on, see, now the angels are rejoicing right now. I don't know what's wrong with word of life. But the angels are over to us with all these lines that we're saying on the So, I'm going to pray corporately over these seven. Y'all know seven is a number of perfection? If anybody asks, you tell them today is perfect Sunday. Because seven souls brought their life back to the Lord. So, those seven, I need you to repeat after me. And for those that know what it's like to be in that seat, repeat it with them to encourage them. Is that all right? Father, forgive me. I once had a relationship with you, and I strayed away. But now, God, on today, on Perfect Sunday, I rededicate my life back to you. Thank you, Father, for never leaving me, for never forsaking me. Thank you, Father, for welcoming me back home. And now, God, I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate the Lord one more time.
Amen. 